Once upon a time, Rex and Weevil were among the best players in the world. With skills and strategy that gave them the opportunity to participate in some of the most prestigious tournaments in Duel Monsters history. But because of the game's ever evolving nature, Rex and Weevil went from being champions to just flies in the wall. As an antagonistic but comedic duo, who saw their chances of winning go extinct before their eyes as they were crushed like bugs and got Tyrannosaurus wrecked, which caused them to try and rise to the top once more using some less than savory tactics. So today we're going to be looking at Rex and Weevil's 10 most important cards how they helped them climb the spout to the top of Duel Monsters, and how they helped turn them both into the dinosaur losers they are today. And at number 10, we have Red-Eyes Black Dragon, who was, according to Rex, the strongest card in his deck during Duelist Kingdom. And that makes a lot of sense, especially back in the game's early days, because Red-Eyes Black Dragon is a ferocious dragon with a deadly attack. It might seem strange at first to see the dinosaur duelist playing a dragon monster, but this was actually common for Rex's strategy. By using weaker dinosaur monsters in the early game to defend his life points, Rex could eventually evolve into using more powerful dragons to stampede his opponent with their higher attack. Overpowering opponents not through brains, but through sheer strength. This was especially apparent with Red Eyes when it was equipped with Dragon Nails, which brought its attack to 3000, meaning that most opponents had no way of actually defeating it, virtually guaranteeing Rex a free win. In fact, in his Duelist Kingdom duel against Joey, once Rex had established his combo, he was so confident he was going to win that he actually wagered his red eyes for Joey's Time Wizard. However, Joey was unlike most duelists that Rex had faced, and although he was still somewhat of an amateur, he actually managed to defeat Red Eyes and win both the duel and the card. And Red Eyes was honestly much more of a threat in the hands of a duelist like Joey, who could allow Red Eyes to explore the potential hidden within and let it change into newer, different forms, because of Joey's willingness to grow and evolve as a duelist. Something that someone like Rex, ironically enough, wasn't able to do. Likewise, if Red Eyes just remained in Rex's hands and was stuck as a vanilla beat stick, it would have been forgotten by both the anime and the TCG. But because Joey gave it the opportunity to grow, Red Eyes has had several cards that have impacted the game's meta over the years. Red Eyes Black Dragon itself is a terrible vanilla monster, and one that's been outclassed as a beat stick even before it released. But many of its evolutions, including the likes of the Red Eyes Dark Dragoon, Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, and even Red Eyes Black Meteor Dragon, are all successful cards that show the hidden potential contained within Red Eyes. However, there's something to be said about Rex's particular tactic, because while he refused to evolve, his strategy did. You see, dinosaurs and dragons have a strange connection in Yu-Gi-Oh, with it sometimes being implied that dinosaurs are the ancestors of dragon monsters, and nowhere is this more apparent in the evil archetype a deck where reptiles become dinosaurs and then dinosaurs become dragons. As a standalone archetype, evils have only ever been rogue viable, but their boss monsters, the evil swords, were once at the center of one of Yu-Gi-Oh's most oppressive strategies, Dino Rabbit. This strategy used Rescue Rabbit in order to summon out two level 4 normal dinos from the deck, and then overlay them into Evil Sword Dolka or Evil Sword Lagia, two of the strongest rank 4 monsters available in 2012. Now in the modern day, Dino Rabbit is a lot less viable but echoes of the strategy can still be found in modern dinosaur decks where Dolka remains as an amazing end board piece. And that just goes to show that while Rex's strategy was viable, he didn't have the ability to change or adapt with the times. He was destined to be left in the dust as a duelist at the TCG, picked up the remnants of his strategy to improve it for the modern era. And at number 9, we have Goki Bore, who almost acted like a calling card for Weevil Underwood. Goki Bore is a level 4 earth insect who has 1200 attack due to its ability to roll over enemies with its round and spherical body. At first, Goki Bore was a somewhat insignificant part of Weevil's insect army that he used against Yugi during the Duelist Kingdom arc, and was easily dealt with after Weevil's field was wiped by a well-timed mirror force. While this was the only time Goki Bore was actually used in a duel, like any other good roach, Goki Bore infested the anime, reappearing so often as a card that was so common that Weevil was more than willing to trash it, or throw it away, being the supposedly rare card that Weevil offered to another duelist to sneak Parasite Parasite into Joey's neck prior to their duel. But Gokibore's most iconic feature was definitely in Yami Yugi and Weevil's duel against the Orichalcos arc, where Weevil taunted at him and claimed that this card was one that held Yugi's lost soul, and tore it up in front of him, which was enough to make Yami's soul go berserk. Funnily enough, Gokibore isn't the ever common card that the anime made it out to be because other than in the Speed Duel reprint, it's only been released in a McDonald's promo pack, so it's definitely not a card you'd be willing to tear up, even though it's definitely not amazing. However, Weevil had the right idea by trashing his insects. Not literally, but a lot of meta-viable insect strategies throughout the game's histories are able to gain a lot of advantage by setting up their graveyard with insects, from the likes of the Demise OTK, which would use Advanced Ritual Art to send insects from their deck to the grave, 
which could then be used as fodder for Doomdozer, to more modern strategies like Bee Troopers that are based almost entirely around abusing the graveyard effects of insect monsters. In fact, one of the most viable insect monsters of the graveyard effect happens to be an evolution of Gokibore, Gokipol, which, if sent to the graveyard, lets you add any level 4 insect monster from the game from your deck to your hand. This opens up a lot of options for powerful insects to search that even non-insect strategies can take advantage of. But if you choose to add a normal monster with Gokipole, such as Gokibore, you get to special summon that monster for free, and then you get to destroy any monster that has an attack greater than or equal to the monster you summoned. So in all honesty, Weevil should have shown this seemingly forgettable insect a little bit more respect. Because if he'd used it more after his duel against Yugi, he might have discovered the card's hidden potential. And at number 8, we have the two-headed King Rex, Rex Raptor's ace dinosaur during the Duel's Kingdom arc. And at an impressive 1600 attack, it's not hard to see why, with its two heads attacking as one. King Rex was actually the first monster that we ever got to see Rex summon. And in the tournament he played in, it must have been a genuine threat, as it carried him all the way to the finals where we see him face off against a Weevil. Unfortunately for Rex in this duel, Brains triumphed over Brawn, because the moment Rex tried to squash Weevil's bug, Weevil had a trap prepared, and immediately countered by giving his basic insect equip card to reduce Rex's life points to zero. But regardless, he still seemed to see the strength in King Rex, because he used it to great success in his duel's kingdom duel against Joey, where it put a dominant display by overpowering a ton of Joey's weaker monsters. Meanwhile, King Rex has never had the opportunity to really come across as a terrifying threat, but strangely enough, it still has the potential to be really useful of a card for dinosaur strategies. Dinosaur decks being able to take advantage of a normal monster is nothing new, especially given the impact on the meta that a deck like Dino Rabbit had. But even in the modern day, dinosaur decks still have a lot of synergy with normal monsters. And while most definitely no longer play Rescue Rabbit, they do play Ground Xeno and the Transcendosaurus monsters. These cards redefine the place of normal monsters in dinosaur strategies. Ground Xeno can add any dinosaur tuner or normal monster from your deck to your hand, with your combo lines changing depending on the monster you play. Often, you'll see dinosaur players add Xeno Meteorus, since Ground Xeno destroys a monster in your hand after searching, letting you immediately summon out Meteorus from your hand, and then you can play Meteorus' effect on the field to special summon any dinosaur normal monster from your deck. Usually, this will be a level 6 monster to give you access to rank 6 plays, but theoretically, you can use Meteosaurus to summon out any normal dinosaur, including King Rex, which gives you access to any level 10 dragon, sea serpent, a dinosaur, or worm synchro monster. But that's not the only utility that these normal monsters have either, because Ground Xeno has a second effect at Fusion Summon. So if you use Ground Xeno to add a normal monster and pop up a baby Cerasaurus afterwards, you already have the fusion materials necessary to bring out Transcendosaurus Gigantozaur. And that normal monster can be any dinosaur, from the high attack Megala Smasher X to the comparatively smaller Little D to, of course, two-headed King Rex. So it's really interesting to see how Rex's normal dino beatdown strategies has managed to not go extinct and serve as proof that, despite the natural disasters of effect monsters nearly wiping them out, it's the environment around our monsters that determine if they survive. And swarming into number 7 is Basic Insect, the first monster that we ever saw Weevil summon. Basic Insect is a level 2 Earth Insect with 500 attack, but definitely not the one you're used to. Because of its low attack, Basic Insects are usually found traveling in swarms with their ideal environment being in the forest. And this was something that Weevil knew how to take advantage of, because in his Duelist Kingdom duel, he led Yugi to a forest zone to boost his insect's attacks, since he was aware of the Duelist Kingdom rules already. And he needed this advantage, as most of Weevil's insect monsters started off as puny with low stats, which is also why he'd buff up his weak insects with equip cards and weapons, allowing him to take down even the likes of Rex's two-headed King Rex. And the funny thing is, Weevil's use of equip cards and insects might have just been an accidental stroke of genius. He was just a few years too early, because it just so happens one of the best decks you could be playing in 2012, alongside Dino Rabbit, was Insectors. An entire strategy of insects that are strengthened by their equip cards, and their monsters' effects to equip other Insectors to themselves. However, unlike Weevil's strategy, the best part about the Insectors being equip cards wasn't the stat buff they could give, it was the absurd amount of advantage they could generate from their cubs falling off, allowing you to easily build up crazy boards or break one with Insector Hornet's pop. Now, Insector as a strategy isn't around much in the modern day, but a ton of insect decks such as Bee Troopers are reliant on Insector Picoflena, which allows you to equip any insect monster from your deck to an insect you control. And Bee Trooper basically uses this effect as a foolish burial, and equips their monsters of choice with a resident insect. Then they link off their monster and resident insect goes from the field to the graveyard, allowing you to use this effect to search for any level 5 or higher insect. So while Weevil's particular execution of his basic insect strategy is barely enough to bug most players, 
insects using equip spells has actually proven itself to be a really strong and viable strategy in the actual TCG. Ruling over the number 6 spot is Tyrant Dragon, the strongest dragon monster that Rex ever played. Tyrant Dragon is a level 8 dragon with 2900 attack and 2500 defense, making it a powerhouse of a beatstick. Especially since it could attack twice in a single battle phase if your opponent controlled a monster after Tyrant Dragon had finished its first attack. And thanks to the bead embedded on Tyrant Dragon's head, it couldn't be targeted by traps either, as any trap that targets Tyrant Dragon is negated and destroyed. However, for all this power, you may have to pay a cost, because while Tyrant Dragon doesn't have any extra stipulation on summoning it normally, if you want to summon it from your graveyard, you have to tribute a dragon monster. But Rex didn't have to worry about the stipulation at all, because the only time he used it was in his Oracalcos duel against Joey Wheeler, where he summoned it from his hand by tripping off two of his dinosaur monsters. Tyrant Dragon seemed unstoppable at first, as it managed to take down Rex's former boss monster, Red Eyes Black Dragon, and was so dominant that Rex actually resummoned Red Eyes to Joey's field so that Tyrant Dragon could attack it again, with Red Eyes only being saved by Joey's trap card which thankfully did not target Tyrant Dragon, and gave Joey a chance to strike back on the next turn with Gearfree the Swordmaster. However, if you want Tyrant Dragon to live up to the dragon-destroying boss monster the anime made it out to be, it's not really worth playing in a dinosaur strategy, because since Tyrant Dragon is a dragon monster, it works best when paired with other dragons. Its effect is a little bit too outdated to see any kind of impact in the modern TCG, but in GOAT format, a Tyrant Dragon stats allowed to feature as part of a somewhat rogue strategy in King Dragon Turbo. This deck relies on summoning out King Dragon, so that you can take advantage of its protection and abuse its other effects to spell to summon some powerful dragon monsters from your hand that would otherwise be too resource intensive to bring out. The dragon monsters you can bring out with Dragon range from Horus of Black Frame Dragon level 6 to Fuzilier Dragon. But Tyrant Dragon is a premier choice because of its high stats and its ability to attack monsters twice, which made it a pretty absurd beat stick that could easily drain away an opponent's life points. So while Rex may have been playing Tyrant Dragon in the wrong kind of deck, the way he used it was actually somewhat relevant, since Tyrant Dragon's ODK potential, while niche, actually had a place to call home. But in terms of the modern era, the only meta that Tyrant Dragon is part of is the Metaphys. And at number 5, we have Insect Queen, Weevil's main boss monster from Battle Onwards. The interesting thing about Insect Queen is that it gets stronger if you get a ton of insects on the field, getting 200 attack per insect. An Insect Queen even synergizes with herself because if she destroys a monster by battle, you get to summon out an insect token during your end phase, making her even stronger. But there's a price to this strength, as in order to declare an attack, you have to attribute a monster. But regardless of this downside, Weevil did an amazing job of making Insect Queen seem like an undefeatable monster. And that's because Weevil did everything he could to ensure that Insect Queen got every single advantage it could before a duel had even begun, something that we got to see firsthand in Weevil's Battle City duel against Joey. In this duel, Weevil once again showed that he was an intelligent duelist. Because even his perfectly ultimate Great Moth had been defeated, he managed to bring Insect Queen to the field by using Eradicator Aerosol to destroy his own Pinch Hopper, and special summon from the hand without needing to tribute for its summon. And not only that, but he also paired Insect Queen with Cockroach Knight, who, when sent to the graveyard via Insect Queen's tribute, would return to the top of the deck, ensuring that Weevil had tribute fodder necessary for his queen to attack every turn. This was a very smart move from Weevil, and one that made Insect Queen a genuinely terrifying threat that reached a beefy 3400 attack. It was almost enough to take down Joey, but this duel also proved another thing. Weevil hadn't learned from Duel's Kingdom and was still just as much of a cheater now as he was back then, because prior to this duel, Weevil had paid off another duelist to sneak a copy of Parasite Parasite into Joey's deck. This gave Weevil a huge advantage, as not only did Parasite Parasite prevent Joey from attacking with Insect Barrier, but also meant that every monster Joey summoned would be turned into an insect, further increasing the strength of Insect Queen. Or at least, almost every monster. And it makes sense that Weevil would resort to such seedy tactics to make Insect Queen viable, because the card actually sucks in the TCG. Theoretically, Insect Queen can act as an okay beatstick for older insect strategies, but it requires a ton of investment. Not just to bring to the field, but so it can remain a threat and keep taking down opponent's monsters. Which means that more often than not, it's not worth it to bring out. In fact, Insect Queen's retrained Metamorphosed Insect Queen, while a lot stronger, doesn't really have a viable deck to call home. However, if you wanted an insect boss monster that can do what Insect Queen does but better, you could just be playing Bee Trooper. While the Bee Troopers don't have the same royal authority as Insect Queen, not only is it deck capable of generating a bunch of insect tokens, but its boss monster, Giant Bee Trooper Invincible Atlas, is one of the most threatening insect monsters in Yu-Gi-Oh, with an effect that prevents it from being targeted or destroyed by card effects, so as long as the attack is 3,000 or less. But it also has an extra effect that, like Insect Queen, requires a tribute. But instead of needing the tribute to attack, you instead activate one of two effects, 
where you either get to special summon any bee trooper from your deck, or you get to increase Atlas's attack to 5,000. Well over the absurd attack that Insect Queen managed to reach in the anime, all without needing to cheat like Weevil. But it makes sense that he had to in order to stand a chance, because despite Insect Queen's title, the only thing you can really rule over is bottom tables. Molded up at number 4 is Cocoon of Evolution, a monster that allows for Petite Moth to grow into a monster that has even more attack points than Blue Eyes White Dragon. But in order to get access to that monster, you have to equip Cocoon from your hand or field to a Petite Moth you control which changes its attack and defense to be the same as its cocoon. And depending on how much time you give Petite Moth to grow, it'll turn into a different monster if you tribute it. If you only wait two of your turns, Petite Moth can turn into a Larva Moth, who only has 200 extra attack. But if you give Petite Moth four of your turns of the cocoon, it can turn into a Great Moth, an almost fully matured version of Petite Moth with a solid 2600 attack. However, if you wait for six of your turns, Petite Moth can fully mature into a perfectly ultimate Great Moth. A huge beat stick with 3500 attack, which was, according to Weevil, only outclassed by Gate Guardian and the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Now, as you can imagine, even in the anime, it was a pretty big ass that Petite Moth stand in the field for what amounted to 12 turns total in order to bring out the ultimate monster. To the point where a Cocoon's first appearance in Weevil's Duel Skin Mark against Yugi, he was only able to solve for a few turns before Yugi broke the Cocoon, which only allowed for Great Moth to hit the field. And to Great Moth's credit, its flying capabilities and poisonous skills made it a real threat, and one that almost managed to defeat Yugi. But it was in Weevil's duel against Joey where he got to see the cocoon live up to its true potential. Because of Joey's sneaky tactic of placing Parasite Parasite into Joey's deck, all of Joey's monsters were now insect monsters. And when combined with Insect Barrier, it meant that he couldn't attack at all. This gave Weevil the perfect opportunity to stall out the game so that he could potentially allow this moth to grow into what it always meant to be. Perfectly ultimate Great Moth. And this is another instance where it makes sense that Weevil had to rely on some less than savory tactics to give him an advantage. Because in the TCG, trying to summon any Petite Moss evolutions with its cocoon is going to be an uphill battle. Even when Cocoon was first released, there were a ton of easy ways for your opponent to get rid of Petite Moth well before you had access to your ultimate moth, including just beating over it by battle. Which, despite its 2k defense, is pretty easy to do if they have 5 turns to build up both their board and their resources. And even if you actually manage to stall out long enough to summon Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth, it's actually not that good of a boss monster because despite its impressive stats, Ultimate Great Moth has no kind of protection from anything, which makes it subject to removal and stat modifiers, which is actually how Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth was defeated by Joey. Now, thankfully, there's actually a modern version of Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth known as Ultimate Great Insect, which you can summon out immediately from your extra deck by tributing any insect multi control that has 2,000 or more defense and is equipped with a card, which means you can get a pretty effective 3k body with Petite Moth and Cocoon on turn 1, and one with a solid battle phase effect too. However, there's actually a format where the original perfectly ultimate Great Moth dominated the meta. In Speed Duels, one of Weevil's best skills is Cocoon of Ultra Evolution, which lets you tribute an insect monster on either field that has a card equipped to it so that you can special summon an insect monster from your deck, ignoring its summon conditions. And Parasite Paranoid is a card that can equip to any monster on the field and changes its type to insect. So you would use Paranoid to equip it to an opponent's best monster, tribute it for the cost of Ultra Evolution, and then special summon Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth from your deck. And because of the format's lower start and life points, the 3500 attack on Ultimate Great Moth was a huge threat. So it's cool to see that Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth can actually be a busted boss monster with the right tools supporting it. And it just proves that as Weevil spent more time trying to strengthen his skills and strategy rather than scheming, he could actually have unlocked the true potential of the card. And at number 3, we have Serpent Knight Dragon, a card that served as proof that Rex Raptor was a pro duelist. Serpent Knight Dragon is just a normal monster with 2350 attack and 2400 defense, who was supposedly created from the souls of a wicked knight. But to Rex, Serpent Knight Dragon was more than just a regular normal monster, because in the anime, it was actually a prize card given out only to players who had topped a regional tournament. And Rex was more than willing to boast this fact, as by owning Serpent Knight Dragon, he believed that it put him above all of the duelists who didn't own the card, especially Joey Wheeler. Because in Rex and Joey's Duelist Kingdom duel, after Rex summoned Serpent Knight Dragon, Joey's put on the defensive after his Flame Swordsman was destroyed. And Rex taunted Joey by telling him that a duelist like him would never have the opportunity to own it. But the thing about Serpent Knight Dragon is that it just also showed how unwilling Rex was to change, because he already believed he was near the top of the food chain. And at the very beginning of the series, he was. His dinosaur beatdown strategy had been enough to take him to the finals to face off against Weevil Underwood, which is a genuine accomplishment that Serpent Knight represents. But when he had to face off against Joey, a duelist who was willing to throw stuff at the wall and try new things to see if it would work, and while Joey did make mistakes, he left Rex's Dino Dragon beatdown strategy in the dust, which is why Night Dragon ended up being defeated. 
Because while its stats were enough to intimidate Joey, he summoned Tristan's Lava Battle Guard as a latch ditch attempt at doing something, which bolstered his confidence because if he went down from Serpentine's attack, at least he'd be going down fighting with his friend. But Joey didn't go down and neither did his Battle Guards, because due to their monster effects, they boosted each other's attack, allowing them to literally fight together and deflect Night Dragon Sonic Waves so that it destroyed itself. This was a pretty tender moment for Joey and Tristan that showcased the strength of the bond they shared. But for Rax, it was likely the moment he realized that Serpent Night Dragon wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Even back in the classic days of the game, it didn't make sense to tribute two monsters for a card with less attack than the Red Eyes Black Dragon, who was also outclassed by other strong tribute summons. But since the days of old Yu-Gi-Oh, the game has evolved and a ton of cards have grown with it. Blue Eyes was once a standard but made a good beat stick, and while 3000 attack is still strong, it's also an integral combo piece in its own strategy. Red Eyes' uses has changed in a number of different ways, which have given it its archetype a ton of utility and a ton of different strategies. Even the Battle Guards, despite being somewhat neglected, have their own OGK strategy centered around swarming the field with Feast of the Wild Level 5s and summoning Battle Guard King. But Serpent Knight Dragon hasn't changed at all since it was first released. It's still the same beatstick it was in 2004 with no support or decks that incentivize using it above other cards. Because even within its own niche of being a decent level 7 normal monster, it's still just outclassed as it was back then. Except in Speed Duels where it also has an overpowered support card just like Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth. And at number 2 we have Insect Barrier, Weevil's main stall tool that from Battle City onwards enabled his best strategies. And that's because Insect Barrier prevents any insect type monster opponent controls from attacking while it's face up on the field. This might seem like a strange choice at first, because in the original series Weevil was pretty much the only notable duelist that relied on an insect based strategy. But Weevil was tricky and found a couple of different ways to convert his opponent's monsters into insects, so that Insect Barrier actually had some crazy value. From Parasite Parasite to even DNA Surgery, the moment that Weevil turned his opponent's monsters into insects, they couldn't attack, which opened a world of possibilities that were only enabled via stalling. The most iconic use of this stalling was to summon up perfectly ultimate Great Moth, but in Weevil's Oracalco's duel against Yamayugi, he went all in on this stall strategy, and played direct attackers like Legal as well as cards that could burn every turn, like Poison Butterfly to gradually whittle down Yugi's life points. And the thing is, it was pretty smart of Weevil to try and prevent his opponent's monsters from attacking at all, because this is actually a pretty strong effect, since even in the modern era, the battle phase is one of the most important phases in a duel, as it gives you an easy way to remove your opponent's monsters in the field or just win the game outright. However, if you wanted to prevent your opponent from attacking, there are a ton of cards out there that can do what Insect Barrier does, but better. From Messenger of Peace, to Scrubbed Raid, to even the classic Swords of Revealing Light. Each of these cards are a great way of putting a stop to your opponent's battle phase on their own without needing to rely on specific two-card combos like Insect Barrier. Because without a DNA surge to back it up, the only way Insect Barrier is doing anything useful is if your opponent happens to be playing an insect deck already. And while this isn't entirely impossible, it's a lot less common than you'd hope. So while Weevil's use of Insect Barrier did showcase his strategic intelligence, it also showed that he lacked common sense. Because instead of trying to change his opponent's monsters into insects to make the card work, he could have played a ton of other stall tools that would have done the exact same thing, but better. But Weevil wasn't the type of duelist to question his own wisdom, so it was pretty unlikely he'd ever figure that out. Sealed in at number 1 is the only card that both Rex and Weevil played the Seal of Oracalcos. By activating the Seal of Oracalcos, every one of your monsters gains a free 500 attack buff. And, while you control two or more face-up attacks with monsters, your opponent can't target your lowest attack monster for a battle. And once per turn, this seal prevents itself from being destroyed by card effects. But, by activating this Seal of Oracalcos, you must pay a price. And in the TCG, that price is that you must destroy all special summon monsters you controlled, and you can't summon from the extra deck at all. Now, the anime version of Silver Oracalcos had a few extra effects too. But the most notable one was that if either player lost the duel while the seal was in play, they'd lose their soul. And that's something that both Rex and Weevil found out the hard way after they lost a duel against the Oracalcos agent Gurimo, and were only given their souls back after Yugi managed to defeat him. But despite this kind act, Rex and Weevil still despised the Pharaoh and his friends and believed that it was their fault they'd fallen from grace, from national champions to the butt of a joke. However, the reality of the situation was that they only had themselves to blame, because while other duelists from the era were constantly adapting and trying to grow as both duelists and people, Rex and Weevil remained stagnant and relied on the same old tricks to try and prove their superiority. Rex and Weevil didn't want a chance to get better at the game. They wanted to already be the best and just be proven right. Which is why, instead of trying to learn and improve, they took the easy way out and begged darts to give them copies of Silver Calcos, which promised them the means to defeat their most hated rivals. And at first, while Rex and Weevil dueled Yugi and Joey, it seemed like the Silver Calcos would live up to its promise, as the pair's boss monsters had almost unbeatable stats. But ultimately, the power that the Orcalcos promised was hollow, 
because while it did give them a solid advantage, Atem and Joey were just better duelists. They were more skilled and were able to adapt to almost any situation, but arguably their biggest strength was that unlike Rex and Weevil, they didn't duel for power or to stroke their own ego. They dueled for the sake of others, and that drive to save their friends allowed Joey to easily deal with Rex's or Kalko's boosted Tyrant Dragon, and gave Yugi one of his most brutal victories. Now, if you have the same stubborn attitudes as Rex and Weevil, you're not likely to go far in the TCG. But the Silver or Kalkos also isn't going to be doing you any favors. A 500 attack boost is actually a pretty good effect. There are a lot of cards in the modern day that provide similar buffs as a bonus effect, and that's often the difference between OTKing or losing the game. But the Silver Calcos demands too much and gives you too small of a payoff. Locking out the extra deck is a huge downside because for more strategies, it's a tool that gives them access to a ton of different starters, extenders, enablers, and utility options and endboard pieces. So if a deck can't access the extra deck in some way, it's usually a huge downside. And it's not like you can just combo off in the first turn and then activate the Silver Calcos later because by activating it, you destroy all special summon monsters you control. And it just so happens that every extra deck summon type is treated as a special summon, so you're basically just be activating Regeki on yourself. So in order to actually use the Silver Calcos, you need to play a deck that never summons from the extra deck and doesn't have a better field to use, which is a pretty rare combo. However, there is one fairly notable deck that can and has taken advantage of the Silver Calcos before. Skill Drain Beatdown. A deck that tries to limit an opponent's options as much as possible with Floodgates so that whoever has the biggest monster always wins. But Skill Drain Beatdown is an older strategy. And while its style of gameplay is definitely represented in current strategies, these decks rely on newer, better cards that can just do a lot more than the seal, all without needing to risk your soul. Overall, it's honestly fitting that the only card that Rex and Weevil shared is one that's now outdated, redundant, and restricts on what you can do because that represents the reason why they both fell off as duelists. They relied too heavily on old strategies and couldn't change for the better. And that's the main thing we can learn from this dynamic duo. They're a cautionary tale about getting too comfortable with a particular style of dueling, because the meta is always changing and we have to do our best to always keep learning rather than relying on what used to be good. And that's the list. If you like more videos like this one, please let us know down in the comments below. And remember to like the video, subscribe if you want to keep updated on any future lists, and thanks for watching.